A lot of people have heard of the East LA 13, Los Tres, the Biltmore, uh, you know, all the big cases. Not too many people hear about the little cases. In my uh, book, La Cucaracha, El Rebelde de las Cucarachas, uh, there's in chapter 8, there's a story of a little case that we had. And it concerns a, it concerns a, a kid that was murdered by the sheriffs. It's chapter 8 of the book. It is early one morning when the family of Robert Fernandez arrives. The sign outside the basement office only announces La Voz de Huitzli o Pochli. That's La Raza newspaper, for those that can't remember. But these strangers come in asking for me. Through the grapevine, they have heard of a lawyer who might help them. Nobody else is around. It is just them and me. We got to have someone to help us, Mr. Brown. The deputies killed my brother. A hefty woman with solid arms and thick mascara burnt into her skin is talking. She says her name is Lupe. She is a spokesman, the eldest child in a family of nine. The woman beside her is the mother, Juana, an old nurse. Juana is still in shock, sitting quietly, staring at Gilbert's paintings hung on the wall. John, Lupe's husband, sits on her other side. His arms are crossed, bright tattoos over corded muscle. He wears a white t-shirt and a blue beanie, the traditional garb of the Vato Loco, the Chicano street freak who lives on a steady diet of pills, dope, and wine. He does not move behind his thick mustache. He too sits quietly as a proper brother-in-law, a cuñado who does, not, who does not interfere in family business unless asked. Why do you say they killed your brother, I ask? Porque son marranos, Juana cries out and then falls back into silence. Aztec designs in black and red meet her glazed eyes. I ask for the whole story. I ask for the whole story. Robert was 17 when the weight of his 180 pounds snapped the bones and nerves of his fat brown neck. He too lived in Tuner Flats, a neighborhood of shacks and clotheslines and dirty backyards. At every other corner, street lights hang high on telephone poles and cast dim yellow lights. Skinny dogs and wormy cats sniff garbage cans in the alleys. Tuner Flats is the area of gangs who spend their last dime on short dogs of T-Bird wine, where the average kid has eight years of school. Everybody there gets some kind of welfare. You learn about life from the toughest guy in the neighborhood. You smoke your first joint in an alley at the age of 10. You take your first hit of carga before you get laid. And you learn how to make your mark on the wall before you learn how to write. Your friends know you to be a vato loco, a crazy guy, and they call you ese or vato or man. And when you prove you can take it, that you don't cop to nothing, even if it means getting your ass whipped by some other gang or the cops, then you are allowed to put your mark, your initial, your sign, your badge, your placa on your turf with the name or initial of your gang, White Fence, Cuatro Flats, Barrio Nuevo, the Jokers, the Bachelors, or what have you. You write it big and fancy, scroll-like, cholo print, Graffiti on all the stores, all the garages, everywhere that you control or claim. It's like the pissing of a dog on a post. And underneath your placa, you always put CS, con safos. That is, up yours if you don't like it, Ese. <laughs> there is no school for a vato loco. There is no job in sight. His only hope is for a quick score. Reds and ripple mixed with a benny, a white, and a toke. And when your head is tight, you go down to the hangout and wait for the next score. On the day he died, Robert had popped reds with wine and then conked out a few hours. When he awoke, he was ready for more. But first he went down to Crony's on Whittier Boulevard, the Chicano Sunset Strip. Every other door is a bar, a pawn shop, or a liquor store. Hustlers roam freely across asphalt, decorated with vomit and dog shit. If you, call, if you score in East L.A., you score on the boulevard. Broads, booze, and dope. Cops on every corner make no difference. The fuzz, la placa, la chota, los marranos, la jura, or just the plain old pig. The eternal enemies of the people. The East L.A. Sheriff's substation is only three blocks away on 3rd Street, right alongside the Pomona Freeway. From the blockhouse, deputies come out in teams of two to serve and protect. Always with 36-inch clubs, with walkie-talkies in hand, 
always with gray helmets, shotguns in the car, and 357 Magnums in their holsters. The Vato Loco has been fighting with the pigs since the Anglos stole his land in the last century. He will continue to fight until he is exterminated. Robert had his last fight in January of 1970. He met his sister Lupe at Crony's. She was eating a hamburger. He was dry, he told her. Would she please go to the store across the street and get him a six-pack on credit? No, she'd pay for it. Tomorrow is his birthday, so she will help him celebrate it early. Lupe left Robert with friends. They were drinking Cokes and listening to the jukebox. Robert liked Mayate music, the blues. They put in their dimes and sip on Cokes, hoping some broad Aruca would come buy them a hamburger or share a joint with them. I know cronies pretty well. I live two blocks away with... I know if you sit on the benches under the canopy long enough, someone comes along with something for the evening's action. This time, the cops brought it. By the time Lupe returned with the six-pack, two deputies were talking with Robert and his friends. It all began, he told her when she walked up, just because he had shouted Chicano power and raised his fist. The cop told me to stay out of it, Mr. Brown. I told him, Robert is my brother, but they told me to get away or else they'd arrest me for interfering, you know? Juana says, tell him about the dirty greaser. Oh, yes, we know this pig. He's a Chicano. Twice he's arrested, Robert, Lupe says. Yes, Mr. Brown, Juana could not restrain herself. That same man once beat up my boy. He came in one day about a year ago, and he just pushed into the room where Robert was sleeping. He dragged him out, and they held him for three days. They thought he had stolen a car, but the judge threw the case out of court. That pig hated my boy. Robert had been in jail many times. He'd, he'd spent some time at the youth authority camp, but he'd been off smack over a year now. He still dropped a few reds now and then, and yes, he drank wine, but he was clean now. The cops took him in from, from cronies, they said, to check him out. They wanted to see if the marks on his arms were fresh, but anyone could tell they were old marks. Lupe appeals to John. That's the truth, Brown, the brother-in-law says. Robert had cleaned up. He even got a job. He was going to start working next week. And we were going to have a birthday party for him that Friday, Juana says. The deputies took Robert and told Lupe not to bother arranging bail. They told her he'd be released within a couple of hours. They thought he might just be drunk, but mainly they wanted to check out his arms. They, pay they said for her not to worry. An hour after he was arrested, Robert called his mother. The cops had changed their minds, he said. They had booked him for plain drunk, a misdemeanor. The bail was set at $500. He told me to call up Maldonado, his bail bondsman. Robert always used him. I could get him out just like that. All I had to do was make a phone call and then go down and sign, you know? The office is just down the street. I didn't even have to put up the house or anything. Mr. Maldonado always just got him out on my word, the mother cries. Juana had called the bail bondsman before she received the second call. This time it was a cop. He simply wanted to tell her that Robert was dead. He'd just hung himself. And would she come down and identify the body? He was so cold, Mr. Brown. He didn't say he was sorry or anything like that. He just said for me to wait there and he'd send a deputy to pick me up, she says bitterly. I went with her, John says. When we got there, I told the man right away that they'd made some mistake. I told him Robert had just called. Then they brought in a picture and I said, Gracias a Dios. I knew him. It wasn't Robert. It was somebody named Sanchez. But that lieutenant said there was no mistake. He said the picture just didn't come out too good. But Juana told him, well, I should know. He's my son. And I told him Robert wouldn't do a thing like that. He'd never kill himself. He was Catolico, Senor Café. He even used to be an altar boy one time. And he was going to get married, too. He was going to announce it at his party. I talked to Patty, and she told me. She said they were going to get married as soon as he got his first paycheck. Patty is pregnant, Lupe says. You might as well as know, Mr. Brown. So what, so what happened after that, I ask? We had the funeral, and they buried him last week, Juana says. Lupe says, we just got the certificate last night. It says he killed himself. Suicide, it says. That's a goddamn lie, John says. Excuse me, but it is. Why do you think he was killed, I say. I know, Lupe says. At the funeral, you tell him, John. Yeah, I was there. I saw it. Doris, another sister, had discovered it. At the funeral, while the others sat and cried, Doris had gone up to get her last look at the body. She bent over the casket to kiss him. Tears from her own eyes landed on the boy's face. She reached over to wipe the wetness from his cheek when she noticed purple spots on his nose. She wiped away the tears and the undertaker's white powder came off his face. 
It was purple underneath. She called John over and he verified it. They began to look more closely and noticed bruises on the knuckles. We told the doctor at the coroner's office, John finishes, but he said not to worry about it. It was natural, he said. Anything else? Just what Mr. De Silva told me, the mother says. Who's that? Andy De Silva. Don't you know him? You mean the Andy De Silva? The man who makes commercials? Chili Charlie? Yeah, that's Mr. De Silva. I know of him. He is a small-time politico in East L.A., a bit actor in grade B movies who owns a bar on the boulevard, and he considers himself something of a spokesman for the Chicano. He served on Mary Yorty's Chicano community board as a rubber stamp nigger for the establishment. He and his cronies, the small businessmen and a few hack judges, could always be counted upon to endorse whatever program the Anglo laid out for us cockroaches. He had been quoted in all the papers during our uprisings against the church at St. Basil's. He had agreed with the cardinal that we were all outside agitators who should be driven out on a rail. What did Andy say to you, I asked. Well, I don't even know him. I used to go to his meetings for the old people. Anyway, he called me the next day after Robert died. He said, I heard about your boy, and I want to help. That's how he started out. I was so happy to get someone to help, I told him to do whatever he could. He said he was very angry, and he would, invest and he would investigate the case. He said he would have a talk with the lieutenant and even with the captain if necessary. What happened? He called me back the next day. He said he had checked it all out and that the captain had showed him everything, the files and even the cell. He said not to make any trouble, that Robert had hung himself. Did he say how he knew about that? Yeah, I asked him that too, John says. He said his nephew was the guy in the cell with Robert. His nephew? Yeah, Mickey De Silva. He's just a kid like Robert. He was in there for something. Anyway, Andy said his nephew told him that Robert had killed himself. But we don't believe it, Lupe says fiercely. Can you help us, Senor Café? I pick up the phone and dial the office of Thomas Noguchi, the coroner for the city and county of Los Angeles. <clears throat> this is Buffalo Z. Brown. I represent the family of Robert Fernandez, I tell Noguchi, and we want to talk with you about the autopsy. Your doctor listed it as suicide. However, we are convinced that the boy was murdered. We have information unavailable to the pathologist conducting the autopsy. I plan to be in your office this afternoon. I'm going to bring as many people as I can and hold a press conference right outside your door. Mr. Brown, please calm yourself. I can't interfere with the findings of my staff. I'll be there around one. I hang up and tell the family to go home, call all their friends and relatives, and have them meet me in the basement of the Hall of Justice. They thank me and leave. I then call the press and announce the demonstration and press conference for that afternoon. I know my man, and since Noguchi can read the newspapers, my man knows me. The afternoon will be pure ham. Noguchi has been in the news quite a bit. He was charged with misconduct in office by members of his own staff. They accused him of erratic behavior and incompetence. They said he took pills, that he was strung out, and hinted that perhaps he was a bit nuts. After the assassination of Robert Kennedy, he allegedly said he was glad Kennedy was, Kennedy was killed in his jurisdiction. He was a publicity hound, they contended. He was removed from his position of county coroner. He hired a smart lawyer and challenged it. The civil service hearings were televised. The white liberals and his own Japanese friends came to his defense. He was completely exonerated. At least he got his job back. A month prior to the death of Fernandez, both the new city chief of police, Judd Davis, and the sheriff of L.A. County, Peter Peaches, announced they would no longer request coroner's inquests. The publicity served no useful purpose, the lawman stated, since the only time the coroner held an inquest was when a law enforcement officer was involved in the death of a minority person. They contended that the inquest merely served to inflame the community. Naguchi had made no comment at the time of this statement, although his two main clients had emasculated his office. When we arrive at the Hall of Justice, the press is waiting. The corridor is lined with Fernandez's friends and relatives. The television cameras turn on their hot lights as I walk in with my red, white, and green briefcase, the immediate family at my side. Are you making any, are you making any accusations, Mr. Brown? The CBS man asks. Not now, gentlemen. I plan to have a conference with Dr. Naguchi first. Then I'll speak to you. I heard into the coroner's office. <clears throat> The blonde secretary tells me Noguchi is waiting for me. She opens the door to his office and ushers me in. Ah, Mr. Brown, I am so happy to make your acquaintance. He is a skinny Jap with bug eyes. He wears a yellow sport coat and a red tie and sits at a huge mahogany desk with a green dragon paperweight. 
The office has black leather couches and soft chairs, a thick shag rug, and inscrutable artwork. It seems a nice, quiet place. He points me to a fine chair. Now, Mr. Brown, I'd like you to read this. He hands me a type sheet of paper. I smile and read the paper. <clears throat> the coroner's office announced today that it will hold a second autopsy and an inquest into the death of Robert Fernandez at the request of the family through their attorney, Mr. Buffalo Z. Brown. It will be the first time in the history of the office that an inquest is being held at the request of the family. Signed, Thomas A. Noguchi, Coney, County Coroner. I look into the beady eyes of Mr. Moto. He is everything his men say. I've been wanting to meet you, sir, I say. And I've heard about you, Mr. Brown. You get a lot of coverage in your work. I guess the press is interested in my cases. Would you be agreeable to holding a joint press conference, he says? Sir, I would be honored. But one thing... If we have another autopsy, the body will have to be, uh, I'm being coy, exhumed, he says. We will take care of that, don't you worry. And who will perform the autopsy? I assume the family will want their own pathologist. I look down at his spit-shined loafers. I shake my head and sigh. I just don't know. The family is extremely poor. I understand, sir. I would offer my staff, sir. Dr. Noguchi, would it be too much to ask you personally to examine the boy's body? I know you are very busy. It is my trump card. I would be honored. But to avoid any problems, why don't I call up the Board of Pathologists for the county? I will request a panel. Yes, a panel of seven expert pathologists. It will be as careful and as detailed an autopsy as we had for Senator Kennedy. And it won't cost the family anything. I have that power, you know. I stand up, and walking over to him, I shake his hand. Dr. Noguchi, I'll, I'll be glad to let you do all the talking to the press. Oh, no, Mr. Brown, it is your press conference. He calls his secretary and tells her to bring in the boys. When they arrive with their pads and cameras, he greets them all by their first names. He's better than Cecil B. DeMille. His secretary has passed out copies of his statement. He tells them all where to sit and knows how many lumps of sugar they want in their coffee. Then he introduces me to them and stands by while I speak. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I'll make it short. We have reason to believe that Robert Fernandez died at the hands of another. The autopsy was inconclusive, and we have since found some new evidence that was not available to Dr. Noguchi's staff. The doctor has graciously consented to exhume the body and hold a full inquest before a jury. On behalf of the family and those of us in East L.A. who are interested in justice, I would like to thank Dr. Noguchi. After the press leaves, I reassure the family and all the arrangements are nailed down. The following Tuesday, I again enter the Hall of Justice. Above me are Sirhan Sirhan, the mysterious Arab who shot Kennedy, and Charles Manson, the acid fascist. Both await their doom. I am told to go straight down the corner, turn right, and the first door to my left is where I'll find Dr. Noguchi and his seven expert pathologists. The light is dim, the hard floor is waxed, another government building with gray walls, the smell of alcohol in night air. I open a swinging yellow door and immediately find myself inside a large dark room full of hospital carts. Naked bodies are stretched out on them, bodies of red and purple meat, bodies of men with white skin gone yellow, bodies of black men with blood over torn faces. This one has an arm missing. The stub is tied off with plastic string. The red-headed woman with full breasts, someone has ripped the right ear from her head. The genitals of that spade are packed with towels. Look at it. Listen, the blood is still gurgling. And there, an old wino, his legs crushed, mangled, gone to mere meat. And there, young boys die too. And there, a once beautiful chick. Look at her. How many boys try to get between those legs, now dangling pools of red-black blood? Don't turn away from it, goddammit. Don't be afraid of bare-ass naked death. Hold your head up. Open your eyes. Don't be embarrassed, boy. I walk forward, I hold my breath, my head is buzzy, my neck is taut, my hands are wet, and I cannot look away from the dead cunts, the frizzled balls, the lumps of tit, the fat asses of white meat. I have turned the wrong way. Backtracking, I find the room with Dr. Noguchi and the seven experts. The doctors wear white smocks. They smoke pipes, relaxed men at their trade. They smile and shake my hand in front of us. The casket is on a cart with small wheels. 
On a clean table, we have scales and bottles of clear liquid. There are razor sharp tools, razor sharp tools, tweezers, clips, scissors, hacksaws, needles, and plenty of yellow gloves. The white fluorescent light shines down upon us. It reminds me of the title of my first book, My Cart for My Casket. Shall we begin, gentlemen? Dr. Noguchi asks the experts. The orderly, a giant sporting an immense mustache, takes a card and a plastic seal from the casket. He booms it out to a gray-haired fag with sweet eyes who sits in a corner and records on a shorthand machine. We shall now open the casket. Corners number 1944-4889, Robert Fernandez, deceased. We all gather close to get the first look. The body is intact, dressed in fine linen. Clearly, Robert was a bull of a man. He had big arms and legs and a thick neck, now gone purple. Two experts lift the body and roll it on the operating table. It holds a rosary in the hands. The orderly removes the, the rosary, the black suit, the white shirt, the underwear, and brown shoes. The chest has been sewn together. Now the orderly unstitches it. Snip, snip, snip. Holding open the rib cage, he carefully pulls out plastic packages from inside the chest cavity. I hold my breath. Intestines, the meat is being weighed out. Heart, liver. A Chinese expert is making notations of everything. So is the fruity stenographer. There is no blood, no gory scene. All is cold and dry, sand and sawdust spilled to the table. Is this your first autopsy? A doctor with a Sherlock Holmes pipe asked me. I nod. You're doing pretty good. He'll get used to it, another one says brightly. When the organs are all weighed out, Dr. Noguchi says, Now, gentlemen, where do you want to begin? Sherlock Holmes asks, Are we looking for anything special? Treat this as an ordinary autopsy, Dr. Rubenstein. Just the routine, says Noguchi. Circumstances of death? Well, uh, Mr. Brown, Noguchi says. I say, he was found with something around his neck. Photographs at the scene? No, sir, a tall man from the sheriff's department says. Self-strangulation or Rubenstein lets it hang? That's the issue, I say. The body was found in a jail cell. The sheriff claims it was suicide. We, however, believe otherwise. I see. We have reason to believe that the boy was murdered, I say. Nonsense, the man from the sheriff's department says. Now, gentlemen, please, Noguchi oils in. Dr. Rubenstein is obviously the big cheese. He comes up to me and says, you think there was a struggle before death? It's possible, I say. He ponders this and then announces, Gentlemen, we will have to dissect wherever hematoma appears. What's that, I ask? Bruises. I look at the body closely. I notice purple spots on the face, the arms, the hands, the chest, the neck, and the legs, everywhere. I point to the face. Could that be a bruise? There's no way to tell without microscopic observation, Rubenstein answers. I say, you can't tell from the color? No. Nope. The body is going through decomposition and discoloration. Purple spots are normal. You'll find it on all dead bodies. Are you saying we have to cut out all those spots? That's the only way to satisfy your... Yes? Well, Mr. Brown, says Noguchi, where do you want us to begin? I look around at the men in the room. Seven experts, Dr. Noguchi and a Chinese doctor from his staff, the orderly and the man from the sheriff's. They want me, a Chicano lawyer, to tell them where to begin. They want me to direct them. It's too fantastic to take seriously. How about this? Can you look there? I point to the left cheek. Without a word, the Chinese doctor picks up a scalpel and slices off an inch of meat. He picks it up with the tweezers and plunks it into a jar of clear liquid. And now, Mr. Brown, says Noguchi, I can't believe what is happening. I lean over the body and look at the ears. Can they get a notch from the left one? Slit, slit, slice, bloot into a jar. Uh, Dr. Rubenstein, are you sure there's no other way? He nods slowly. Usually, we only try a couple of places. It depends on the family. He hesitates, then says, Is the case that important? Would you please take a sample from the knuckles? Here? No trouble at all, my man. Sizz, sizz, em. Blute into another jar. The orderly is precisely labeling each jar. Dr. Noguchi is walking around like a Hollywood mogul. He is smiling. Everything is going without a hitch. He touches my shoulder. Just tell us what you want, Mr. Brown. We're at your service. Would you please try the legs? Those big blotches on the left? How about the chin? Here, on the left side of the face. What's this on the neck? Try this little spot here. We're this far into it. 
Get a piece from the stomach there. Cut here, slice there, here, there. Cut, 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 slice, 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 and into a jar. Soon we have a whole row of jars with little pieces of meat. <clears throat> yes, men. Now we'll open up the head. See where it's stitched? They opened it at the first autopsy. See the sand fall out in the brain area? Yes, keeps the body together for a funeral. No blood in here, boy, just sand. We don't want a mess. See that little package? That, my lad, is the brain. I mean, it was the brain. Well, actually, it still is the brain. It just isn't working right now. Yes, yes. Now we pull back the head. Scalp on this lad here. Whoops, the hair, the full head of hair. Now it lays back, folded back like a Halloween mask so we can look into the head. Inside were the stuffings for the... Jesus Christ, look at those little purple blotches. You can tell a lot from that, but you got to cut it out. Then cut the fucking thing out, you motherfucker. This ain't Robert no more. It's just... No, it's not even a body. A body as a whole. This is a joke. Cut that piece there, doctor, please. Oh, now we get really serious. If he died of strangulation, we'll have to pull out the neck bone. Go right ahead, sir. Pull out that goddamn gizzard. Uh, we have to take the face off first. Well, Jesus Christ, go ahead. Slit, one slice, slit up goes the chin. Lift it right up over the face. The face? The face goes up over the head. The head, the head is the face. There is no face. What do you mean? The face is hanging down the back of the head. The face is a mask. The mouth is where the brain, the nose is at the back of the neck. The hair is the ears. The brown nose is hanging where the neck. Get your goddamn hand out of there. My hand, that is a doctor's hand. It is inside the fucking face. I mean the head. His hand is inside. It is pulling at something. What did he find in there? What is it? He's trying to pull out. If we put it under a microscope, we'll be able to make some strong findings. But it's up to you. Slice, slice, slice. No dice. Give me the saw, please. Saw, 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 saw. No luck. Give me the chisel and hammer, please. The goddamn face is gone. The head is wide open. No mouth. There's no nose, no eyes. They are hanging down the back of the neck. God damn. With a hammer and chisel in his hand. That son of a bitch. The doctor goes to town. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Hack, hack, chuck, chuck. Cha, chomp. I got it. Out it comes. Long, gizzard looking. Twelve inches of red muscle and nerve dripping sawdust. Yes, we'll dissect this old buzzard, too. How about those ribs? You want some barbecue ribs, mister? Sure, I said cut those fucking ribs up. Chop them right up now. How about the arms? Is there any question of needle marks? Yes, they'll claim he was geezing. Cut that arm there. Put it under your machine and tell me later what I want to hear. Tell me they were old tracks, you son of a bitch. And try the other one while you're at it. Why not? The body is no more. Should we try the dick? What for? What can you find in a Peter? Maybe he was raped for Christ's sake. Or maybe he raped someone. How should I know? I just work here. I see the tattoo on his right arm. God Almighty. A red heart with blue arrows of love and the word mother. And I see the little black cross between the thumb and the trigger finger. A regular vato loco. A real pachuco ese. And when it is done, there is no more Robert. Oh, sure, they put the head back in place. They sewed it up as best they could. But there's no part of the body that I have not ordered chopped up. I, who am so good and deserving of love. Yes, me, the big chingon. I, Mr. Buffalo Z. Brown. Me. I ordered those white men to cut up the brown body of that Chicano boy. Just another expendable cockroach. Perdóname, Roberto. For the sake of the living brown, forgive me and forgive me and forgive me. I'm no worse off than you. For the rest of my born days, I will suffer the knowledge of your death and your second death and your ashes to my ashes, your dust to my dust. Goodbye, Ese. Viva la raza.